All right, I want to talk about the fruits, the corrupt fruits. Um, Jesus talked about a tree is known by its fruit. Well, the corrupt fruit of the false gospel of easy believism. Let me clarify what that means. There are two basic streams of easy believism. The first one is that there's no repentance involved. There's no change life after salvation. It's just a simple belief. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're here today and you'd say, I don't know for sure, I'd go to heaven when I die. It's just, I would like you to pray this prayer with me. Say, you know, Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ. And they take you through this little prayer. And they say, if you've prayed that prayer for the first time, then I can tell you that you, you know, and you prayed it in sincerity, then you're going to be going to heaven when you die. Blah, 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 blah. You know, it's this little one, two, three, one, two, three, repeat after me type of a prayer. The Jack Hiles became famous for this with his little soul winning crews that he would send out. And they go out into towns and things like this. And it was all about the numbers. Just let's get these people. Let's, you know, and they push them. They, they like these pushy, you know, salesmen or something, you know, vacuum cleaner salesmen or something on the front steps. And the people are like uncomfortable going, yeah, well, I'm not right. Well, today, you know, today is a day of salvation, friend. And if you don't get saved today, you know, I don't want to take no for an answer because I, this, I'm concerned about your soul. Blah, blah, blah. And, and I've talked to so many people that have had that salvation ramrod experience and, they, okay, yeah, I'll pray the prayer and stuff. And they didn't get saved for one minute. They're just trying to get rid of the person. But they say, if you've prayed a prayer, if you've, you know, done this special little thing and there's no heartfelt conviction or whatever else, you just pray the prayer, you're in. Okay? That's one type of easy believism. The other type, even more ridiculous, is they just say simply, you just have to believe. You just have a belief. It's a, an act of will in your own mind where you just go, Okay, I'm saved. <laughs> you know, you don't even have to ask God for it. You don't have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. You don't have to, no, no, just believe. Just, you know, there you go. You know, <laughs> really, really strange. But they'll say that, you know, the, the biggest thing that these people have, either type of easy believism heretic, they both have a problem with a changed life that comes after salvation. They can't stand the thought of that. They want to be able to just hold on to some sins and say, it's okay, I can do this stuff and, and you know, don't judge me. I'm a Christian and, you know, you see. But let's just look at the, the corrupt fruit that that system uh, brings in. I'm going to show you a little video here of a heavy metal rocker who uh, is still in his secular band. A lot of these guys do this. Um, I know uh, the guy from Megadeth, Dave Mustaine, I think his name is, heard him one time and he's like, oh, I'm a Christian now and stuff, you know. Still in his band, still singing songs about glorifying and worshiping Satan and things like this. And they do. You know, again, I used to be a heavy metal head back in high school. Um, my long hair and the whole deal and stuff. So, so don't even talk to me about it. Don't, oh, you, you know, you're just judgmental. And I came from that group. Okay, I came from that whole thing there. I had a Christian actually witness to me um, the one time because of the way I looked. Long hair and black and skulls and things like that. Don't even talk to me about it, all right? I've been to heavy metal concerts. I've been to rock concerts, uh, both se uh, secular and professing Christian. Uh, don't even tell me about it, okay? So uh, let's watch a little bit of this video here and just show you the ridiculous nonsense that comes from easy believism. Let's check it out. If you were a missionary being sent to the darkest places of the world, we would applaud you within the church. Oh, isn't that man brave? But here you are coming out of the darkest place, meeting Christ, going back to the dark place, and people say, oh, how dare you do that, you know? Good. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna draw my son and daughter away. Well, listen, if you're a good parent, you're not going to be encouraging them to necessarily exactly believe right. the lyrics that you're, right now you're singing. And the story is not done. I don't know if he's going to convert your whole band. I don't even know if that's his plan, okay, at this point in yeah. time. God will let you know, and everybody here knows this, and you know it, when it's time for you to step out, you'll step out. Whoever this, this older guy is, he's just Luciferian Satanist himself. You know, I mean, here you got this guy. I mean, you know, right away you can tell the guy's lost. I mean, good night. You know, I mean, the Bible says, let me show you here real quickly. You know, when I got saved, it was a change. Major, major changes in my life happened. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse uh, 14, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. Why? 
Verse 15, But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Long hair is an act of rebellion. All right? It's right there. Deal with the scriptures. Okay? I mean, and the tattoos. Again, back, you know, in the book of uh, Leviticus. Again, let's go back there. Um... A bookmark here. I'm trying not to knock that out. Leviticus chapter 18, excuse me, chapter 19, um, verse 28. Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. You say, that's Old Testament under the law. Okay. Then uh, what you do is a Bible-believing Christian, you say, well then, for this thing to be okay for today, there should be some scripture in the New Testament that undoes it. Give you a perfect example. There's clean and unclean meats back here under the law. But you go to uh, 1 Timothy, I'll show you this. You know, you're not to eat this, it's unclean. You're not to eat that, it's unclean, all this stuff. But I'll show you here. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. You see how the thing works is, Old Testament says don't eat it. New Testament, it says, hey, it's okay now. So Old Testament says no tattoos. You're not to print any marks upon you. Where does it, where does it uh, undo that in the New Testament? It doesn't. Tattoos are wrong. Tattoos are wicked. We'll be getting into more of that here in a little bit with this guy. But, you know, oh, if you're a missionary going to another country, if you're a mission, missionary going to another country, you go in there and you teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't go in there and say, well, they're headhunters. I guess I have to be too. They're cannibals. I guess I need to be too. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And, you know, you know, a good Christian parent's not going to send them to the kind of, you know, concert that you're doing, some of the lyrics and things. This corn, uh, I looked up some of the lyrics to some of the songs. I can't even, I can't even repeat some of the stuff that these guys say using kind of profanity and filthy, disgusting stuff, but he's saved. He came out of it and went right back into it. You don't know the scripture here on that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, I want you to understand something. At the beginning it says, therefore, what's the next word? If. You know, I, F, if, if. What is that? It's a conditional clause. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. So in other words, we are supposed to judge whether people are saved or not. And the quickest way to do it is when you got saved, did your life change? No, I went back to it. Okay, then you need to get saved. Simple. It's simple. It's a simple test. And you know why it's so important? Because Christians down through the centuries have been persecuted. Horribly persecuted. And you didn't just say, oh, so-and-so is a Christian? Come on in. Sure. You know? Oh, here's a guy. He's a, looks, like a, a, looks like he's a Catholic priest, but he says he's a Christian. Come on in. Why don't you go and teach nursery? <laughs> No, no. You're supposed to judge these people and say, wait a second here, has there been a changed life that accompanied your salvation? I didn't say sinless perfection. Okay, I get that thing put on me all the time. You're teaching people how to be sinless. I have never taught that. Quit lying about me. There must be a change though. This guy's not saved. There's no way. Incredible. Let's continue. I think I want to give you guys the chance to just speak to this of like, because I know you know, and you know this, man. You both know that there's probably a lot of people who are like, they still just don't get it. They don't yeah, understand totally. like why in the world. They must and just being just being in the show, like, it's ain't a Christian show. You know what I mean? So it's like, how? how just give me your guys' take of like, being in corn. You're you're sold out for Jesus. <laughs> Being in corn, you're, you're, you're like sold out for Jesus. If you were sold out for Jesus, you wouldn't go near these concerts. 
Let's continue. But like you're going out on the stage every night, participating in songs that say like "F you." You know what I mean? Like, just what? Talk to me about like why you're still here. That's our, that's our people, man. These are our people. It's a tribe, and and Jesus, he didn't tell he didn't tell people to go into tribes and say, "Hey, don't use your tribal language anymore," because we got to do it this way. This is a tribe of metalheads. They talk like F and N, F and N, F and. That's how they are, and we're here in their tribe, in my tribe, and with my people, just loving on them, hanging out, rocking out with them, showing them, look, we're Christians, we don't judge you. <laughs> look, we're Christians, we don't judge you, man. I mean, you can say the F word all you want, man, it's just our tribal language. <laughs> then what's the standard for sin? Why get saved? What's the point? You see? Because, I mean, any kind of sin that you're committing, you're not, a, you're not a former sodomite. That's your tribal language. That's your tribal ways. You're not a fornicator. You're not a drunkard. That's just tribal customs. Well, what's wrong with these guys? They believe. They're sold out to Jesus. They're, they're Christians. They said that they were Christians. They have belief. You see? There's no repentance. There's no more there's no brokenness of saying, I'm a wicked sinner. God be merciful to me, a sinner. No desire for change in their life. And, you know, and, and, and the discernment of people. And I realize, you know, anybody that's saved is gonna look at this and go, Yeah, <laughs> saved? <laughs> I don't think so. Continue. You know, we're the same, you know, we're we're just hanging out with them, you know. And I'm just telling you, I like I had a full on like the Lord clearly showed me to go back, you know, to this thing. I had a, I had just crazy just experiences with him for 30 days of my house. And then my pastor and two pastors and a prophet confirmed to me to come back. So it's just, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, like, dude, man, you know, like God took me 30 days, you know, at my Jesuit retreat, I mean, uh, <clears throat> church. And, uh, you know, I'm like, he just told me to go back into my lost life. Uh, yeah, man. Just, you know, oh, I don't get it. Don't let me try something here. Oh, whoa, like totally I get it now, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, I guess some of the spirituality that these guys are experiencing is coming from their joint or their pipe or their, you know, needles. <laughs> it's disgusting. I've been in that world, okay? I was a heavy metal guy. Don't even tell me about it. I've been to the concerts. I know the drugs that go on there and the women taking their clothes off right up in front of the stage and throwing clothes up and things like that. And it's a foul, 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 demonic place. God never would call you back into that thing. And I've said about this guy before, David Spurgeon, perfect example, second in command of the Outlaws Motorcycle Gang. You know, wicked, wicked, wicked man. And he goes to federal prison over firearms charges and drugs charges and things like this. And uh, in prison, he gets saved. And he goes and he, he comes out, the judge releases him, a miracle from the Lord. And he comes out and he goes right back to the outlaws because that's where God called him. Uh, no, he had a changed life. And he goes around and he preaches now. He's an evangelist. You know. But I guess I'm being too harsh and judgmental. Let's continue. Hear from the other, uh, you know, devil worshiper guy here. You're not going to believe what he has to say. Let's watch this. Well, you told me a story a couple of days oh, yeah, ago, yeah, yeah. and he said he went out and he was watching uh, Band Chevelle, and a huge crowd out there, and Head was looking at it, and they're all like, yeah, devil horns and all that, and he's like looking at it, and he said he got emotional and like started crying because God touched his heart and said, those are my people. Huh. Dude, like they're out there with devil horns and, uh, and all this stuff, and, and like God said to me, like, those are my people. Wow. Well, I guess they don't need to be saved then, apparently. <laughs> I guess everybody's saved. You know? I mean, Jesus died. Do you believe that? Yes. Okay, you're saved. You're a Christian. <laughs> I mean, just let's just, just take our Bibles and just throw them out. Why do we need standards? The standards are just for judging people. I mean... Yeah, I posted a comment, you know, and said these people, these guys aren't saved. They're lost. You know, whatever. Some people... 
what standard do you have? You know, why do you, why would you say that? And I'm like, well, I just quoted Second Corinthians five seventeen, that if any man be in Christ, there you know he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But what standard do you have? Uh, <laughs> insanity. Let's continue. And I was yeah. like, wow. I was like, all I was those people a out there band getting like emotional. And it, and it touched me because like we do corn concerts in the crowd, and it's like, everybody's like, Ugh! it's like. God's going, those are my people. I was like, wow, they're all, we're all his people. We got to go touch them. And, and how can we do it if we leave? Now we got to make sure you get the Holy Ghost Deluxe Edition or Adventures with God. <laughs> yeah, these, these wicked satanic charismatics. I mean, may the fires of hell consume you wicked people. It just is disgusting me. They, they blame so much on the Holy Ghost. You know, some guy gets up there, you know, it's the Holy Ghost. You know, Turban uh, Helgard, he comes out, Sunderguard, comes out and uh, and he's like, you know, freedom, freedom, freedom. Oh, they're free. They're, uh, they're healed. Oh, and stuff like this. It's the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost. These guys, oh, it's the Holy Ghost. Told, told me that devil worshiping heavy metal, metal rock fans, they're all God's people. We're all God's people. It's the Holy Ghost. You're going to pay. You're going to burn. You're going to burn forever. You wicked people. You wicked, disgusting people. And don't tell me, well, he's just been led astray by false preachers. Um, I understand the minds of these guys. Okay? Um, these guys understand how to hurt Christians. They understand their mission in life is to destroy souls. That's absolutely their mission. They want to damn people to hell. He's not innocent. Neither of those guys are innocent. They know exactly what they're doing. And if they can get a bunch of dumb, modern, professing Christians to think, well, praise God, I guess they're all saved, you know? I mean, never mind the places where Jesus goes and there's the devil, the guys that are possessed with devils and things, and they come out and they run and they worship him. Never mind the fact that over and over and over in the, in the gospel accounts, you have people that are possessed with devils coming and falling down and worshiping Jesus and saying, I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Yeah. But that's not the same as these guys. You know, they're they're different. They're not uh, they're not possessed. But let's uh, continue here. Here we have a uh, CBN, the Catholic Broadcasting Network. Actually, I think it's supposed to be Christian, but it's Catholic. It might as well be. But let's watch this. You're going to see some things, and I need to refute some things here in this wicked nonsense that's being said. So, let's watch. The guy nicknamed Head, corn guitarist Brian Welch, is used to changing tunes, especially after his rock star life caused a radical awakening. I was a millionaire and I had houses, cars, and all that stuff, and I was famous, and, and I had no rest inside. I was an empty shell walking around with anxiety filled inside. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Okay, so let's get this straight. He has all this stuff and he's ruined and he's broken and then he comes and he gets saved and goes back to it. <laughs> okay, yeah, think about that one. Yeah, this stuff is bad and it'll destroy you and all the other things, but I'm going to go back to it after I get saved. And why didn't he quote the context of that passage there where Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What's the next thing? Take my yoke upon you. When you get saved, you are a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And he tells you what you're supposed to do with your life. You know, one of the first things that's going to be that goes? The look of the world. You see, the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, let's turn there, in the King James Bible. The other ones are satanic and from the Vatican. Plenty of videos to prove that. Romans chapter 12 Verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's an order. You are a bondservant, a slave, so to speak. And you are commissioned into the army of God. All right? You are called a soldier. Read Ephesians chapter 6 sometime. You know. But look at verse 2. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You can't prove God's will for your life if you conform to this world. I'm pointing over this way, by the way, if you haven't figured it out, because my computer's right here, you know, to watch this stupid nonsense. He's not saved. Very, very simple. But see, this is what easy believism does. It's just a belief. And you're going to see him later on leading a prayer, an easy believism prayer, to fans of at one of his metal concerts afterwards. Let's continue. When he came in, he gave me that peace and rest that I couldn't buy. To confront addictions and raise his daughter, Brian left Corn, seemingly for good. But nearly a decade later, his surprising return to the famed heavy metal band struck a chord. I know that I'm uh, controversial sometimes with people because I went back to Corn. God is just a loving God who loves us. Jesus was like accused of hanging out with prostitutes and sinners and they're like, how can you hang out with those people? It's the same stuff today. Some of the religious people are like, you know, how can they tell me how can you be in Corn? You know, how can you play that music? Oh, it's the same stuff today, man. Yeah, I'm sure Jesus looked just like you, too. Uh, no, Jesus wasn't hanging out with sinners, publicans and harlots and sinners and things. He came to call them to repentance. He was preaching to them. They were coming to him to be healed, to get out of their lifestyle that they had. Just so stinking disgusting, these people. going to turn there but let me just let me continue here for sake of time i've talked about this thing i mean you know a lot of this stuff it's like i have so many studies on it i'm not going to keep going over it i'm going to go over the one of the things you know but it's just like it, it just gets redundant after a while i mean my word let's continue you know i wouldn't bring my youth group there but <laughs> i'm called to be there to affect people and to uh, be a voice for him and paul said i become all things to all people so that i might save some okay he says paul said i am i am become i become all things to all people that i might save some um no paul never said that he said i am made all things to all men that i might by all means save some god put him through things does that mean, oh, but, but that means that, that God was the one that was putting things. Okay, did Paul ever become a sodomite so he could witness to sodomites? Did Paul become a, a, a headhunter, a cannibal, so he could witness to those people effectively? I heard a preacher say many years ago, um, he said, uh, you know, these people like this have an idea that if you see somebody sinking in the quicksand, you jump into the quicksand with them to help them out. Uh, that doesn't work. No, you get on the dry ground and you reach and you pull them up out of the quicksand and say, don't go back into that again. You know, and I'm doing this whole study so that you'll have these arguments that you can refute these people like this. Because the whole modern church movement is primarily about bringing this kind of wickedness into church buildings and saying this is okay. It's acceptable as Christians now to do this. And it's most definitely not acceptable. And if you are the kind of youth that, like I once was, they thought that this kind of music is good and fine, and I just listen to it for the music and not for the lyrics, man, and, and you know, I don't let it get into my head. I can still quote a lot of the lyrics to the uh, Metallica, Megadeth, ACDC type of stuff I used to listen to. I was a teenager back in the 1980s, okay? Old bands, I realize. I don't even, you know, know anything about a lot of the bands of today. I had to look up some of the songs from this corn thing to see how bad it is, you know, and it's bad. But let's continue here. All things include here, one of 45 stops on Korn's current tour, playing songs to captivated metal audiences from a playlist often described as disturbing. What kind of metal is it? Intense. What kind of metal is it? Intense. You know what God hates? A proud look like that. Intense. Pride. What that guy has, and I, again, I, you know, they don't show a real close up and whatever else, but they got a microphone. It's of a naked woman, this silver naked woman, and and you know her upper body is is right there, you know. And this is this is fine to go in there and Christian and stuff like this. Where's the discernment? Continue. There is 
this music and this aggression, some people don't think about it too deeply. They're just like, I like it, I like it. It's, it's a place where people are passionate. People are saying what's in their heart and is coming out of their mouths. Like, you, you hurt me, you did this to me, and I hate you, and, and but you know, I'm gonna be okay, and I'm stronger because of it, that type of vibe. What was your source of rage? Probably self-hatred and my dad and his anger. That was a big source because, you know, I think his dad struggled with it, then he struggled with it, then I struggled with it. It was just passed down, so it was a lot of factors, but I didn't like myself. <laughs> a little psychiatry there, you know, my dad and his, you know, his dad, and, like, we, like, hate a lot of hatred and stuff like this. And so you come out of it, but then you go back into it. continue. Music appeal aside, metal concerts can double as a place to vent. Is that the tie that connects audience to artist? Is it the rage and the aggression? When we formed our band, our singer Jonathan said, what if we call it corn? What if a kid misspelled the name and we'll spell it with a K and a backwards R? Because he was singing a lot about child abuse. He went through some stuff. And some people have told us that we gave them a voice for their abuse they went through, and they didn't want to kill themselves. Brian identifies with their pain. We're all living this life trying to get through our, our wounds and our hurts and everything, and some people deal with it through drinking and drugs. I did it for years. I didn't know any other way. Sin, it says in the Bible, sin is fun for a season, then it starts to eat your life away. Sin is fun for a season, but it starts to eat your life away. Okay, um, well then why'd you get back to it? It's ridiculous. Where is the new birth? Where is the changed life? And again, for those out there that preach easy believism, is he saved? This Brian Welch guy, is he a Christian? Says he is. Says he believes. Then he must be. He's saved, but I'm lost because I teach repentance. Repentance to God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So I teach that there's a changed life that happens. You come to God and you say, I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I don't want this life anymore. Doesn't mean that you're going to understand all the things that you're going to give up after you get saved. Doesn't mean that. It just means you are there. You need help. And you say, I don't want this anymore, this life. Please, God, save me. You call upon Him in faith. You say, I believe that, that, Jesus, that you know, Jesus died on the cross. That what I've heard about Jesus dying on the cross... I believe that that can save me, that that can wash my sins away. I need to be saved, and I need a changed life, Lord. Help me. I don't want that old life. That is biblical salvation. And when you get saved, then God moves into you the whole, in the form of the Holy Spirit. He moves in, and He starts to say, that needs to go, that needs to go, that needs to go. And you'll find massive changes. I mean, I used to be so big into Hollywood movies, watching them all the time. I got saved, and it was just like, ugh, ugh, it's offensive. Hearing profanity, it was just like, ah, no, I don't want to hear this stuff anymore. Got rid of it. My uh, heavy metal collection that I had, hundreds, of, probably thousands of dollars worth of, of heavy metal, both Christian and, you know, lost uh, stuff. They're both lost. There's no such thing as Christian heavy metal, but that stuff, burned it. Didn't want to listen to it anymore. Why? Holy Spirit was inside of me saying, don't do that. There's nothing here like that. He's not saved. Easy believism is a satanic heresy. Let's continue. How bad did it get for you? I started doing meth uh, towards the beginning of corn before we got a record deal. Then that just opened a the door more for addiction, cocaine, pills, and all that. When I did a world tour, I ran out of drugs on my trip, and I had my dealer send me eight balls and packages of meth overseas. That was my rock bottom. I'm doing anything for my high, even risking my freedom. Still battling his addiction after failed rehab attempts, he was invited to church by an acquaintance. I just felt the presence of God. And the pastor said, don't get your life right and come to Jesus. Come to him with all your garbage. Learn about your faith, read the Bible, and pray, and your life will change. I did those things, and within a couple, a few weeks, I was off the drugs and in love with Christ. Off the drugs and in love with Christ. So you give up one devil thing and go with another. 
I notice he goes to church. Not one verse of Scripture in your King James Bible tells anybody to go to church. The church is the people. Not some stinking building where you can get the people in there. You know, lost people come in and then you put this emotional thing. You use mind control tactics. Harmonics and things like this. I mean, there's so much stuff that goes on in these Babel buildings. Wicked, you know, pagan temples that they are. And they get people with all the emotion of the thing and the emotion of the moment. And then they come forward and they say, pray this prayer. You're in. Boom. You're done. Just do these couple things. Your life will change. And yet they still look like the world. They're still loved by the world. It's incredible. Let's continue. It's a cycle. And I'm, I still fight with it sometimes. You know, just addictive behavior. And so, yeah, it's frustrating. You know, but um, it's like every year I feel like uh, I gain new ground on it. The appeal to that stuff that used to rule my life is just not there anymore. But Brian did face new hardships while single parenting a teen and troubleshooting business betrayals. He was unknowingly being prepared to reconcile with what he walked away from. Reconcile with what he walked away from. Paul killing Christians, you know, and he went back to it again after he got saved, right? No, no. He's never experienced true conversion. Let's continue. God's son came to this earth and he was considered faithful because he suffered and walked through this life so he knows all of our pain. What do you think it was that was necessary where you could return to Corinth? God was forming Christ in me. He's using all the pressures and difficulties. We do our best, but he does it supernaturally. And if we let him through trials, we become stronger. By humbling me, and he could build me back up. And when he built me back up, I was strong enough. And he said, you're ready, go. We've been through it all. So it's already rooted enough to be where there's a brotherhood there. and We're just kind of sticking by each other a day at a time, just like family does. Who knows what tomorrow will bring. For Brian, it could bring another concert and another tattoo adding to the 35 he has. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they, when they had an encounter with God and they had a revelation, they would build an altar, right? Those were the altars in remembrance of what happened. And so these tattoos are my altars. They're my remembrances. And it's ever before you. Get a hold of that one, okay? You're gonna see he drops a couple little buzzwords here to let you know that he is a hardcore Satanist. These tattoos are my altars. You say, oh, you like that altar where they sacrifice. There's dual meaning there. See, that's for the uninitiated. They say, these are my altars. People go, oh, like in the Old Testament and stuff like he said there. But in the mind control field, what's he saying? These are my altar personalities, my altars. It's mind control. Multiple personality disorder, disassociative identity disorder. These are my alters. And that's exactly what a lot of this stuff is. Right? Tattoos in mind control are showing alter personalities. That's why a lot of them will have monarch butterflies. They're showing their alters. So he just gave a little hint, a little wink wink to those that are in the know. Just so happens that I know about this stuff because I've studied it for many years. So you're not going to deceive this preacher. I understand what he's saying. And you're going to hear him talk later on about the Shekinah glory and stuff like this. He, again, he's going to use witchcraft terminology that the average person doesn't have a clue about. The god and goddess, the joining of it, the hexagram. Let's watch this. You'll see it. You can see, you'll, you'll see it here on his eyes. He has it, he has it tattooed on his eyelids. Watch this. You, Ever don't, before you, you don't have to travel to get to the altar. Right? And if I leave my Bible at home, bam, Bible verses <laughs> right there. When you're on stage and you occasionally do the, oh yeah, there's Galatians. Yeah, right there. It's like, I'm having a bad show. Look at this. My pick hand, <laughs> I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right there. You know, why Hebraic words for both those eyelids? I like to go inside the word and really find out what it means. And so the glory of God, there's Shekinah glory and the Kabod glory. And uh, Shekinah is like the, the, the sweet presence, the inner dwelling, and the, the Kabod's like the weighty 
like powerful presence of God. So I just, um, I just loved the, the meaning of that. I like to go into the Word, and, and you got the Shekinah and the Gabbad and all this other stuff. It's called Kabbalistic magic, is what this stuff is. Masonry has this thing: the square and the compass, the the hexagram, the two interlocking triangles. Again, this thing is straight out of the occult. In the occult, there's a teaching of the god and the goddess. That you put the two of them together in sexual intercourse. Okay, sorry to have to be graphic here. The upward pointing trial symbolizes the masculine genitalia. The lower downward pointing triangle symbolizes the female. You bring the two together in the sex act. That's worship. That's what these people are. This is exactly what he's talking about. But they say they say it in a veiled way and things like this. There's a teaching in the occult that Moses, when he would come down off the mount, he was his face was glowing and stuff like this. And they say that's the Shekinah glory and all this other stuff. And to the uninitiated, they go, oh, okay, yeah, that sounds good. To the initiated, what they're saying is that Moses was having sex with God. That God's partly woman. God's partly female. That's what this teaching is. Again, they, people go, oh, I don't know, I think he's a Christian. He just, you know, he has some things he needs to work on. He's a Satanist. He's a hardcore Satanist. And he's rubbing it in people's faces. Totally rubbing it in people's faces. Just disgusting. Well, let's continue. He was revealing revelation with those words with, to me. And so I, I put them on my eyelids. Love that. Eyes open wide. Yeah. Revelation. Yeah. That's with my book, with my eyes wide open. It's talking about the eyes of the heart being open and enlightened. Yeah, my with my eyes wide open. It's talking about the eyes of the heart. I'm enlightened, or you could say, I don't know, illuminated. What is it that you most desire? Entered apprentice, light. Fellow craft, more light. Masonry. Straight up occultist. But he's saved because he believed that he is. See the mess you get into? Let's continue. By revelation. And I want as many people as possible for their spiritual eyes to open so they can see that God is real. Despite the band members' varying beliefs, Brian's focus is to give to others what he's received. What's the mission now while you're with Corn? I want as many people as possible for their spiritual eyes to open so they can see that God is real and that he loves unconditionally and all this wounding and this and this uh, up and down life that we're living as we walk towards our day that we have to eventually die, all of us, that he's right there and he is the resurrection and the life and we're fine. And we can experience that resurrection and life on this side of eternity now. You get to know and walk with the person who is raised from the dead now. You walk with them in life. And it's just, I want those people to get this. Because that's that's where the adventure comes, you know? You walking with them. A lot of, some of you corn fans know that I found faith in Christ. Look at us. We're just <laughs> we're just messed up people that a mighty, like beautiful, powerful God came and had mercy on us. So just displaying them to those people and letting God do his work. Just letting God do his work, man. I mean, it's just like it's right there, dude. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's just so disgusting. And again, you know, God loves unconditionally. And it's just, it's just, you know, open your spiritual eyes and all this other stuff. Uh, God does not love unconditionally. All right, there's a whole lot of conditions that will get you God's wrath and his judgment. You say for lost people, for both. Okay. Um, we're, Christians are not appointed to God's wrath. I understand that. But what I'm saying is there are things that you can do that, as a Christian, as a born-again, saved Christian, bought by the blood of the Lamb, all that stuff. There are things that you can do to get you killed by God. All right? You get out of fellowship with the Lord. You don't confess your sins to Him and, and say, hey, I'm sorry I did that thing. God will drop you. God is a God of love. That's correct. But God is also a God of judgment. And you are supposed to have fear of God. That's supposed to be there. And lost people? God loves you unconditionally? No, He does not. There is no such thing in Scripture that says God loves, present tense, a sinner. All right? Unless the sinner is saved. Lost sinners? 
God's love was manifest one time, and that is at Calvary. And if you don't meet him there, if you don't come to the foot of the cross and repent, come to him and get saved, his love is not for you. His judgment and wrath is for you. Let's continue. What could the church do better to earn a voice to that audience? They can get real with themselves and realize that they are just like those people in the metal crowd. They're, they're broken and without God, then they're not holy. There's not one that is perfect except Christ. We all need Him. We're all the same. Stop judging, be patient, and, and don't, don't be afraid to, to let your light get close to Him and let your light shine. Okay, no, we're not all the same, all right? I'm not the same as those people there. I once was, but I'm done with that life. I've changed. I'll tell them, oh, the church needs to just say, you know, stop judging. You know, let me just tell you something here real quick, Christian. One of the quickest ways that you can tell whether somebody's saved or not is when they come out with a thing of saying, you need to stop judging. If they have a problem with judgment, they're not believing this book. This book is all about judging. And it's not judging and saying, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. Everybody else is going to hell except for me. That isn't it. This book judges sin. Why? To help you get away from it as a Christian. And to help you come to the cross as a lost person. Sin, all sin, all sin is negative. Every single last bit of it. And that lifestyle that this guy's living is a negative lifestyle. And let me tell you something else, too. I understand about the heavy metal world and the, the big Hollywood world and stuff like this, and the mind control that goes on there, and the satanic ritual abuse. I understand for him to get to that point that he's gotten to, he's done some sick, sick stuff. There's some really, really warped, twisted stuff. There was some heavy metal guy that came out years ago. I forget which band he was with or something like this, but he was talking about going to these high level elite parties and stuff. And he's like, people were paying like all kinds of money to get in there and they were doing, you know, you know, human sacrifice there. Yeah. Yeah. That world is a very sick, twisted, disgusting world. And if you get saved out of that, you would run truly saved out of it. You'd run away from that world. Say, I'm never going back to that thing again. This guy's a minister of Satan. That's what he is. Let's continue. How do you guard your heart against judgmental Christians? Just look the other way and don't listen. But when I, when I do have to hear it or I do find myself reading it or whatever, I just, you know, say, you know, Lord, uh, I feel anger. I, for, I choose to forgive them and, uh, you know, cleanse me of bitterness. You know, what do you do when you have judgmental questions? I just forget them and I just say, oh God, just forgive them for being so wicked and, you know, judgmental and stuff. Lost. Look now how he tries to justify his sin by saying stuff from the Old Testament. Check this out. God has been doing this since the beginning. Read the Old Testament. Joseph in Genesis, he got sent into Egypt. He was like given some Egyptian name or something and, and he dressed like them and had the jewelry and I mean, I bet you Christians back then, if they were Christians, they'd be saying, ah, he looks like the world, you know? Joseph, like, he, like, got sent to Egypt and stuff, you know, and, and everything. Well, he was sold into slavery, so let's get the story straight there. And he, like, dressed like him and totally like it and everything else. Um, you can dress like people from another culture without being in sin. But I guarantee you, Joseph didn't have any tattoos on his body. I guarantee you that. ridiculous. I mean, Joseph, he gets in trouble initially, you know, because he doesn't, basically, he doesn't allow himself to fornicate with this, you know, guy's wife. But, you know, he should have fornicated. Although fornication might not have been one of the customs of his tribe that he was part of. Now you talk about Daniel here. Check this out. Daniel, you know, they changed his name and he was right in there with all the uh, just uh, it was crazy, you know. It's just so God does. He's been doing that for a lot of years, you know. And uh, and so we're, it's nothing new. It's just <laughs> it's so absurd. Daniel, like he's like totally right in there, man. I mean, he's like 
you know, changed his name and everything. Yeah, and he got thrown in the lion's den because he was praying when the rules were saying that you're not allowed to. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't bow to the idols of, of Babylon. You know, him and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, Daniel was up with the king and stuff at that point in time because he interpreted the dream and all that, you know. But my, my point is, he wasn't going along with the, the system like this guy is. It's not that he's going along with the system, he never left it. Let's continue. Sometimes the Christianity in America and, and the, 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 the religious system will just say, hey, you can't do that. But God's been doing it for a long time. While touring, Brian hits his high note, first performing for an audience, then meeting to pray with them. Okay, pause there in a minute, because you're going to see him do the little easy believism prayer. But, you know, it just I just need to make a point here. Um, having been through the heavy metal world and stuff in the past, um, it's very, very close to hell. Uh, that's why they glorify, and, you know, ACDC, I'm on a highway to hell. You know, that was one of the songs that, you know, I would listen to back when I was a professing Christian, you know, heavy metal, only listening for the musical quality, not the lyrics, of course. Uh, right. But it just, you know, it's, he's there and he's head, moshing his head and stuff like this, and they're there, you know, like this and thing, dark and laser lights shining. Kind of interesting. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They don't come to the light, you know. They're actually giving kind of a precursor to what it's going to be like in hell. Down there screaming, loud noises. He's going to be doing that exact thing. Unless he gets truly saved, which I highly doubt. Let's continue. Let's hear what he prays. And give me a brand new life. Give me a brand new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's it. <laughs> give me a brand new life, man. I mean, just, just give me a brand new life. In Jesus' name, that's it. Well, man, he just led probably 30 people to the Lord right there, if you believe in easy believism. I mean, if you're one of Stephen Anderson's zombies, uh, he's of the quick prayerism, the Jack Hiles prayerism thing. Is that guy saved? Says he's saved. He's prayed a prayer. He's obviously soul winning if you're of the uh, Fenninger and uh, Robert Breaker crowd uh, that says that there's no prayer it's just a simple belief it's just an act of the will you just simply go there I'm a Christian now I just went uh, and I believe and there that's it I'm in question is he saved I mean you can judge can't you you don't you do have a standard, don't you? Let's continue. Let's finish this ridiculous nonsense. This is the 700 club by the way too if you haven't noticed that. 700 club with uh, Pat Robertson. Let's continue. Some people will come to him saying, "Lord, Lord, you know, we did this in your name, this that in your name." And he said, "I never knew you." So I want Jesus to look me in the eye and say, "I knew you." and you knew me, and I know you, and you know me. Yeah. Shut that thing down. <laughs> it's so disheartening, you know, but uh, the reality of it is, if somebody truly wants to find the Lord, they're gonna find the Lord. Um, the Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon Him. Um, there are people that are lost, and they'll pray, and they'll say, God, I don't even know what to do. I have no idea. I just want to be saved. I, I want to know, how do I be saved? God will get them to that point of salvation. Maybe you're like that out there today. Um, maybe you've been wondering what true salvation is. Uh, let me just let me tell you. You can watch our salvation message at our you know, main channel page, it takes you through the scriptures, shows you what true salvation really is. Um, if you're in that world right there, this heavy metal world, or if you're in the Baptist world or whatever else other world out there where you've believed, you've said a prayer or whatever else, 
and you think that that makes you saved, and yet there's no real changed life, um, let me tell you what salvation is. Salvation is a brokenness so that Jesus Christ can fix you. Salvation is coming to the foot of the cross and saying, I'm a sinner. There's repentance. What is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind where you no longer trust in your self-righteousness. Repentance is also a change in your direction. All right? It's not Lordship Salvation that says you've got to clean up all this stuff. It's a lifelong you know, repentant thing where you, you know, and you eventually are, God grants you repentance and, and then you eventually get saved down the line way after you've cleaned up and you've made Jesus the Lord of your life. No, no, no. That's a heresy. That's a heresy. You come to the point as a sinner where you say, my life is a wreck. I need help. But every time I try to help myself, it doesn't work. And you hear the gospel, Jesus Christ died for your sins. He died for your sins. You understand? He died on that cross. And I've heard people, they say, well, I don't really feel sorry for... You mean to tell me you don't feel sorry that some innocent man had to die to pay for your sins, your evil things that you've done? You don't feel sorry about that? Jesus Christ on the cross, bleeding, beat to within an inch of his life, and then they hammer nails through his, his hands and his feet. And he's there and he's bleeding and he's dying a slow, torturous death at the hands of the Romans. The Romans today are the Roman Catholics. And yes, the wicked Jews, they went to Pilate, but it was Pilate that carried out the death sentence. All right? So don't give me this thing, well, the Jews killed Jesus. The Romans killed Jesus. No Jew ever swung a hammer. You understand? Just had to throw that in there. But the fact is, Jesus Christ is dying on the cross. Why did he die? He became sin who knew no sin. He took your sinful life and put it on himself and died in your place. You should die. But he died in your place. Can you come to that point and realize that? That you're a sinner and your personal sins killed Jesus Christ? Because if you do, if you believe that, if you believe what this book says about Jesus Christ, how that he died for your sins, his blood that he shed on the cross can wash away your sins and can take them away and you can have a new life in Christ Jesus. You will be given a new life. And what will happen at that point of salvation, the Holy Spirit will move into you and will start to clean up. You know the things that you've been ashamed of there in the past? Those bad things that have messed you up and you had no peace? The Holy Spirit comes in and says, that needs to go, that needs to go, and you get rid of those things. Finally, you can overcome those addictions. And now you start going, wow, I feel totally different. You know, I was on the highway to hell at one point in time as a young man. I was even a professing Christian the whole time, like that guy. Ironic, his name's Brian, my name's Brian. Very funny. You know, actually not very funny, but you know what I'm saying. I was headed for destruction, and I had to come to the place where I realized I'm not saved. I have nothing in common with these people in this book. Nothing. I'm worldly. I'm doing all kinds of wickedness. I have no convictions. And I had to come to a place where I was broken, and I said, God, I need help. And I put my faith in Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross to pay for my sins. And His righteousness was imputed to me. He took my sins on the cross and He gave me His perfect, sinless, righteous life that He lived. His righteousness is now imputed to me. I no more have my own self-righteousness. I once did. I thought I was a good person. Then I realized I wasn't a good person. Jesus Christ is the only one that's good. You see, He paid for my sins. And when I put my faith in that and I called upon the name of the Lord to be saved and I said, God, please save me. I accept Jesus Christ's death on the cross as the payment. The only, that's the only thing I have, Lord. I want out of this life, this wickedness. Please, please save me. And it wasn't some kind of little thing. I just went, okay, let me pray this prayer here. Okay, we're done. I agonized about it. I cried. I was down on my knees my face on the ground saying, God, please save me. 
I don't want to go to hell when I die. And he did. He saved me. If you're deceived by this kind of guy or these wicked false prophets that are just telling you it's just a belief, there's no repentance involved, if you don't even have to pray, you're just going to, you know, or whatever else they're teaching you, I suggest you get saved. You get born again. And, you know, you keep praying, you keep, you know, saying, God, please save me until you see that changed life happen. Make sure of your salvation. Make sure. <laughs> because if you don't, you're going to hell with people like that. And these other people out there that are, that are false, teaching false gospels. Um, if there's no changed life, it didn't take. And, you know, there's an old hymn, What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Yeah, you will feel a wonderful change in your heart. And it isn't going to be, hey, I went back to the old life again. Uh-uh, no, no. You'll come out of it. So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. Please make sure of your salvation.